We learn of an early neighbor of Hinduism, the Ju the, uh, Ju namely Judaism, which honors at its port the harvest of every season. And Judaism has a deep regard for everything that's human, honoring in their ritual of all seasons and all human experiences. Listen to the words of the sacred text of Deuteronomy, which happens to be my favorite book, believe it or not, because it reminds us to choose life. Buddhism comes a little bit later, and the Buddha traveled the world. He'd heard of some of these other religions, and he tried all kinds of asceticism until he was down to a couple grains of rice, and he practically died. He was a, a living scarecrow. And he looked at human life really, really carefully. And then when he left his Buddhist heritage, it leaves us with a whole sense of precious knowledge, of consistent philosophy of life, to be who we are all the time. And so His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who is one of the people that people most revere, asks us to cherish what he calls a steadiness of mind, a steadiness of mind in the face of all the misfortunes and dislocations that we experience in life. We have a lot of those right now with the economics and, and all, of, all the other things that we're facing. And the Dalai Lama says it this way, humanitarianism and true love for all beings can only stem from an awareness of the content of religion. By whatever name religion may be known, its understanding and practice are the essence of a peaceful mind, and therefore, of a peaceful world. If there is no peace in one's mind, there can be no peace in one's approach to others, and thus, no peaceful relationships between individuals or among nations. Catholic Christianity at the beginning of the turn of, turn of uh, the first century is a really colorful port. Lots of color, and you'll see this tomorrow too. Uh, expressing itself in sacred symbolism and allowing everything to speak of the creator spirit. It is aware of Jesus as very incarnate, incarnate God. That means a God with flesh. And is often referred to as love in action. Theologian Paul Knitter reflects it, about it this way. He says, what Christians do know on the basis of their praxis, that means living out their religion, of following Jesus, is that his message is a sure means for bringing about liberation from injustice and oppression. That it is an effective, hope-filled, universally meaningful way of realizing soteria. That is to say, human welfare and liberation of the poor and the oppressed. And promoting God's kingdom in so doing. Not those who proclaim Lord, Lord only, but those who do the will of the Father and will enter the kingdom. And he picked that up from Matthew's Gospel. So the Catholic port is the port of love in action, whereas the Orthodox Christianity port invites us to look into the depths of the waters to a recognition of the profound mystery of God. And yet, accessibility of the divine, for example, through iconography and art. Emphasis on meditation and iconography welcome us to the world of a really deep spirituality and orthodoxy and beauty. To really live the words of Sochanithan, who says, beauty will save the world. We forget that in our public school system sometimes when we knock out the music, knock out the art, and so forth. Art Imandrite Nathaniel of a Russian Orthodox monastery paints a picture of the ideal of beauty in Orthodox Christianity. And he says, 
The understanding of God is the understanding of beauty. Beauty is at the heart of our monastic life. The life of prayer is a constant well of beauty. We have the beauty of music in the holy liturgy. The great beauty of monastic life is communal life in Christ. Living together in love, living without enmity, peaceful with each other. And I might add that the Shakers and the Quakers have picked that up too, that when I was in a Quaker, um, in a Shaker place one time, they croon to their people when they're dying. They shake this huge cradle back and forth and use music. And I noticed with older people, they forget everything else, but they remember the songs. Recently, my uncle and aunt were together. My aunt died. They're both 96, been married 73 years. Mm -hmm. And my uncle Ralph sat by my aunt until she died, the weeks before she died. And he sang all the old songs and held her hand. Mm -hmm. And my cousin said that my aunt tried to say the, sing the songs with him. So we don't forget the song, even when we're 96. And orthodoxy picked that up. Islam is held up by pillars of strength and a rhythm of prayer that laces together all of daily activities. And we can open ancient volumes, we forget this, of its heritage of mathematics and medicine. We really, they really kept a lot of the treasures in those fields for us. Professor Muhammad Mashuf Ibn Ali explains, the human being, the servant, is the trustee of creation under the sovereignty of God, capable of transforming it within the framework of the divine will. Humankind's obedience to and fulfillment of the divine command results in happiness and thus unites both worldly and cosmic justice. This visionary paradigm is the unity of religious and cultural consciousness, and it enables the assembly of a formidable force to spearhead a new world order where the consensus is salam, peace. And so we need to encourage that and encourage our, our Islamic brothers and sisters to really um, cooperate with us in, in the shaping of peace in our world. There's a new report after Islam that was created during a time of flowering uh, disciplines during the Renaissance, very really like our world today. I often think of the Renaissance as right now because you had, you had historical things happening, you had the language things happening, you had archaeological digs, you had music, you had, you had all kinds of things. It must have been a really wonderful, chaotic world like we read in the papers about today. <laughs> but anyway, um, at that time, Protestantism arose, the Reformation, and um, this flowering left us with a whole sense of individual freedom under God, the love of the Word of God, profound honoring of pluralism, and as Luther used to say, engagement in the marketplace. I just attended at San Francisco Theological Seminary a wonderful ecumenical service. It was their 50th anniversary of the DMIN program. And all the Catholics were crying <laughs> in the back. All, everybody was crying at this service. They, were, they even said the Nicene Constantinople Creed of 381. You know, it was, it was really something. Our well-respected Anglican Desmond Tutu has some things to say about the marketplace and the world bringing uh, religion into the world, uh, the harmony. He says, faith is a highly political thing. At the center of all that we believe as Christians is the incarnation, the participation of God in the affairs of the world. As followers of that God, we too must be politically engaged. We need inner resources, however, in order to face the political demands of our time. 